Here, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks for outing me. Yeah, we were in Hawaii. Really cheap flights on Southwest, by the way. So uh, <laughs> it was amazing. So kids, family. For us, uh, it was kind of a crazy week because we have so many connections in Boulder. My family and I, we lived there for five years. We worked at CU. We worked with a campus ministry there and have a huge heart. Still have friends there, have friends that live right by the King's Supers and just... You know, it is such an interesting feeling, isn't it? And the only thing as you grieve and you mourn and you you grapple with the situation is our world needs Jesus. He's the only hope. He's the only hope. So today, we're going to talk about that. And you know, it's Palm Sunday, which is the tradition where Jesus is in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and he's coming, and, he, and the, the people are praising, they're worshiping him, they're singing, Hosanna, blessed is the one, is the name who comes to the, from the Lord, and they're just worshiping Jesus. The question I want us to ask today, and it's a very simple question, but it changes everything how you answer this question, is why did Jesus come to earth? Why, why did he come? Why did Jesus, the Son of God, come to earth? Jesus came because the Father sent him. And Jesus didn't come just willy-nilly like, oh, I'm going to show up to earth and see what happens. He came on a mission. He was sent. He knew exactly where he was headed. And on Palm Sunday, as he was coming into Jerusalem, he was hearing the praise, but he knew where his eyes were fixed. They were fixed to the hill where he would go die, where he would be crucified, where he would bleed, and then when he would bring hope to all of us by raising again from the dead. That is the good news that Jesus was bringing, that he had been sent And right before he got into Jerusalem, there's a story in Luke 19. He actually kind of goes through a town called Jericho. And he's going through Jericho and everything's going great. And all these people are coming to see who who Jesus is. And, And there's this guy named Zacchaeus. He was a short dude. And he couldn't see over everybody. So Zacchaeus climbs up in a tree. And Zacchaeus was a really wealthy man. And he was known as a sinner because he indulged in a lot of things. He was really wealthy. And Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus, and I love Jesus because it's such a Jesus story. He's walking along, and he sees Zac up in the tree, and he's like, Zacchaeus, I'm staying at your house tonight. I'm going to party with you. You you know how to party. I'm going to party with you. So he goes to Zacchaeus, and and all the Pharisees, all all the religious leaders of the day, they were just condemning Jesus, looking at him. They're going, I can't believe. I can't believe it. Jesus, you say you're the son of God, but you'll hang out with this guy? And I believe Jesus said why he came right to those Pharisees at that moment, Luke 19, 10. This is what he says. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus didn't come for the people all put together. Jesus came for the hurting, the broken, the Zacchaeuses of the world, the Jasons of the world. I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. He came for you. He came to seek you out, to find you. He came on a rescue mission, and he knew exactly what he was doing. So Jesus' purpose was to seek and to save the lost, the people that are broken like you and I. So what are we supposed to do about it? That's the question we're going to answer today. What are we supposed to do about it? If this is Jesus's purpose, if this is what he was doing, why he was going to the cross, what then is his disciples, as his followers, are we supposed to do? We're in this short series, Fishing Lessons, and if you didn't catch last week's, it was awesome. Uh, I watched it in Hawaii, I promise. I know about your son. I I promise I watched it. Um, It was great, Ron. Uh, But it made me really want to go fishing. I was like, man, I so want to go fishing because I absolutely love fishing. And uh, as I listened to Ron talk, he he talked about how the Jesus came to fish for, that he called us as his disciples to fish for people. And we should be engaged in that heart and in that posture that we should want to see our friends, our family members, our loved ones, our world 
come to know Jesus. And at Restoration, we talk a lot about the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It's where Jesus commissions his disciples on what they should do next once he leaves. But did you know there's actually five commissionings that happen throughout the gospel? It's not just one time. Jesus repeats it every single time. In every single gospel, we see that the commission of Jesus, he is sending his people out. He is saying, this is your mission. This is what you're supposed to do. And it's not for the like, Green Beret Christian, the like best of best. It's for anyone that says, Jesus is my Lord. We are to be his disciples. You're a disciple no matter where you're at in your journey. If you're like, man, I just put my faith in Jesus. You're his disciple and this commission is to you. And so these are these five commissionings. Today we're gonna look at John 20, 21 and this is his commission. It says this, Jesus said to them, so he says right before he leaves to heaven, He looks at the people and he says, peace be with you. I think Jesus knew we were going to have a lot of hardship in our world. I think if you were to look at Boulder, I think if you'd look to us today, he'd say, peace be with you. Because the only place peace can come is through him. Peace be with you. As the Father sent me. See, Jesus was sent. The Father sent him. What is it? So even so, I am sending you. You, I am sending you. And when he said this, what did he do? He breathed on them, hopefully it was good breath, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus was not leaving us to do life alone. He does not leave you to do the work that he has commissioned or sent you out to do by yourself. He has given his spirit to live inside of us to give us the power and everything we need to go out. Because he was sent, we are sent. You know what? You're sent to fish. You were sent to fish for people. So do you want to fish? Ron did a great job last week trying to get people, oh yeah, even if you don't like to fish, do you want to fish for people? Do you want to fish for people? Anybody have a yeah? Yeah. Okay, yes, okay, thank you. Appreciate that, front row. (laughs) Most people, though, what I've found is they actually want to catch people. They want to see their friends. They want to see their family members come to know Jesus. The problem is we don't really know how. We don't know how to fish. We're like, what am I supposed to do? So today what I want to do is I want to help you learn to fish. So it's going to be a really practical message. So if you want to get out a phone or a piece of paper and pen, I have some notes that you want to take. Just about how do you actually go and engage people with Jesus. How do you catch fish? And I want to tell you a little bit of the lessons I learned from my fishing trip in Canada. So like I said, I love to fish. I grew up fishing. I've fished my whole life. Like when I was a little kid, I started fishing, but we went on an epic fishing trip to Canada, my dad and I, trying to go after muskie. We'd never caught muskie before. So two years ago, we went to Canada and there are these massive predator fish. And you can show a couple pictures because you got to show pictures if you're, uh, oh, I forgot Judah. Oh, well, that's Judah catching a fish. I forgot a story. Oh my goodness. Uh, Okay. I'm going to tell you a secret though. If you want your kids to love fishing, you can't take them fly fishing. It stinks. You don't catch anything. You take them to a stocked pond and you throw power bait. If you want your kids to like fishing, you actually got to catch stuff. And so Judah loves fishing now because he catches fish. Now he'll go with me all day and we'll catch a few. But if you want your people, if you want your kids to love fishing, you have to teach them how to catch fish. I love catching fish. And so I want to share, I'll show you now my, uh, some pictures from Canada. This was me with a northern pike. It was pretty awesome. And we were after muskie. Muskie are incredibly difficult to catch. I didn't catch one, just FYI. But my dad did. I was super excited. This is a picture of my dad with a muskie. Go to the next. Yeah, that's, that's my dad. He caught this amazing muskie. It was so exciting. His dad had caught a muskie. He had never caught one. And it was like, it was like, Tears filling our eyes when he pulled in that muskie. Thank you for bringing all my fishing gear up here. Thank you. Uh, And then lastly, my buddy caught, he'd been multiple times that we went with, he caught this muskie, which is unbelievable. 52-inch muskie. They're like alligators when they they take the bait, too. It's amazing to see. They'll follow it, just hit it hard. 
So today, I want to teach you guys some lessons that I have learned from my time fishing that I believe correlate with how we should influence and impact and share our faith and fish for people. So the first lesson, bring out my props here, okay. The first lesson you want, if you go fishing, you need to get a guide. So guides, they always wear these shirts, you know. Also, frat guys always wear these shirts, but uh, <laughs> fishing guides wear these shirts to protect themselves from the sun. And you, you want to find... Like, if you're going fishing for muskie, I had no clue what I was doing. So I needed to get a guide to figure it out. So we walk into this lake, or walk to the, go to the lake, and this guide puts us in a boat. He teaches us how to catch muskie. He teaches us how to, throw the rock, how to throw the lure, where to throw it, how higher to throw it. And as I think through just our faith, a lot of times we have no stinking clue when I'm like, hey, you can go influence your friends. You're like, I have no clue what to do, Jason. What you need to do is you need to find some guides in your life to help you. And so that's what I love about this church. I was a little worried that I was like cockeyed with this. Uh, okay, I'm good. I was going to have my wife come and like fix my buttons. Uh, <laughs> a, a lot of times, what I love about this church is that we want to help you we want to come alongside of you. We don't want to just tell you, hey, go reach your friends. Go share your faith and not actually give you the tools to do it. So this is why we have Simple Church. This is really what Simple Church is about, is it's not just about learning the Bible. We do learn the Bible. But it's also about how do you have conversations? How do you influence others around you? How do you talk about Jesus with other people? And so I want to encourage you. I know we talk about it, you're like, Simple Church Again, yes, Simple Church Again, is if you have not joined a Simple Church, join a Simple Church. If, if you want more information, please talk to me, talk to Ron, talk to any of our staff. We would love to connect you in a Simple Church because in these, we also want to encourage you to lead one. We don't want you just to be in one. We want you to lead one. And when you get to lead, all of a sudden, you're getting to talk about God with the people that you're leading a Simple Church with. And in those leadership the people that are leading our simple churches, we're actually doing training events with them once a month to help them be equipped on how to share their faith, how to have tools. Ron shared the bridge illustration. We want to equip you guys with how do you do that, with how do I share my story. You need some tools so that you can go engage. And today, I'm, that's the guide part. I'm going to be your guide. I'm going to give you six little lessons that I believe if you will just do them, you will actually see influence, impact, and you will catch fish. So the second thing is you need to go fishing during the best time of the day. So the best time of the day, so go fishing, you look at your clock, you wake up early, you get up before the sun's up, and then you go out, and typically the best time to catch a fish is in the morning or in the evening, especially in the summer, because it gets so hot that the fish go deep and you can't catch them. And so when fish are eating are typically morning and evening. I've seen this very true in people that I'm trying to reach out to and share the gospel with. There's two really prime times where people are just hungry for Jesus, and it's in transition of life and tragedy of life. Transition of life and tragedy of life. This is when people I've noticed have just been, have a heart that is open to the things of God. When they're going through a transition, when they've moved, when they just moved into your city, they're looking for friends. They're looking for connection. Your neighbors, when you see a, a moving truck pull up, you're going, that person's in tr transition. They, they must, they're kind of in this new phase of life. Or when someone has a baby, all of a sudden their life is completely changed. Or when they go to college or when they get their first job. Just, I think God has set up transitions in our lives to wake us up a little bit. To go, maybe I should change something about what I'm doing. And the second is tragedy. When something hard happens, when a shooting happens, my prayer right now is that God would do something unbelievable in Boulder. I'm praying for a massive revival. I know the spiritual climate of that city, and it is so needing of Jesus. And I believe tragedy, it hurts us, it cuts us, but it actually makes us think of eternal things. We don't really think of our death that much. But when tragedy happens, we start going, where am I going once this is all over? This might seem a little opportunistic, like, are you just taking advantage of people? 
I'm trying to love people because I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest news. It's the best thing that someone could ever receive. And I am going to do anything it takes and find the best opportunity to share the gospel with them. So the first step, if you want to influence and impact, just start opening your eyes, looking for people that are in transition or tragedy in their life. And just trying to love and care about people during that. So go fishing during the best time of the day. The third lesson is find the location of the fish. Uh, if, you're, if you're a fisherman, you know you have your spots that you don't tell anyone about. You lie, you post, you put things like, oh, I caught it over here. No, you never tell someone where the honey hole is. You have exactly like your map. You know where those fish live. You know where they're going to be. And you go to where the fish are at. And what I love about Jesus is he did not stay in heaven. He came down to earth to us. He did not stay up and go, ah, they'll figure it out. No, he went to us. If you want to catch fish, you have to go to the fish. And how you go to the fish is you got to learn to think like a fish. So for most of us, we, we can kind of live in our little bubble of our life. We can kind of think through just all the, all the different, our like responsibilities, our family, and we don't get outside of our thinking. Here's the four ways you need to think like a fish. You need to go where they live. You're not going to reach people for Jesus if you stay in your house all the time. You need to go where people live. Where do they live? Where do they work? Where do they play? They're not in your house. They're at the park. They're at your job. They're at the grocery store. I know COVID has made us very much in our own bubble, but we have to continue to go where people are at. The second thing is you need to see where they're at. You need to gain the right perspective. Have you, you ever been fishing and, uh, or been on the water and you put on polarized sunglasses? All of a sudden, it's like this brand new world that opened up below you. A lot of us, we are so blinded by our own things that we don't have the right perspective. We don't see the world how lost people are people that don't know Jesus. We don't see the world how they see it. We need to open our eyes and go, where are the fish at? What are they doing? What do they care about? What do they love? You need to talk to them. You need to spend time with them. You need to love them. You need to find people in your life that don't know Jesus and you need to do these things. You have to go where the fish are if you want to catch fish. If you want to see lives change, you've got to go where the fish are. I was uh, in a Simple Leaders church, church training call uh, two weeks ago and a guy named Dave Shelpuck, who is an unbelievable fisherman, uh, he was just like talking about he wanted to reach his neighborhood for Jesus, and he wanted to do something about it. He's like, I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, it, like, the lights went off. He's an external processor. He's like, you know what? I think I need to like, get a grill, and he lives in Cap Hill, and I need to just put it in the, like, right by the sidewalk, and I need to bring out some wine and just start grilling and offering wine to people. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen is Dave is going to catch a fish. Because he's where the people are, and he's doing what the people care about. It's like, oh, wine? Oh, burgers? Yeah, I'll take some of that. You got a vegan burger? Yeah, I got some of that too. And offering and being where the people are. He knows the fish won't be in his house. He knows the fish are outside. So Dave is thinking, how do I go be where the fish are? You have to go where the fish are. Fourth point is you have to have patience and persistence when it comes to fishing. Don't worry, there's not a hook on this. You got to throw out and you reel back in. And guess what? Nothing bit. And you continue to just be patient and you're persistent and you keep going and you keep being around people. They say the muskie is a fish of 10,000 casts, that it will take you 10,000 casts to actually catch one muskie. My wife, Molly, she is an she, she would say she's not an evangelist, like that's not her gift set. And when we hear these kind of messages, they're like, Jason, that's great, but your gifting is evangelism. I actually don't know if my gifting is evangelism or not. And Molly would say the same thing. She's like, I don't know if I'm an evangelist. She goes, I just actually share the gospel more, and so I see people come to Christ. She's just throwing the bait over and over and over again. She's out there loving people, caring about people, bringing up conversations. And if you do it enough, you know what happens? Eventually, you catch a fish. I, I think of a, one of my friends here. I'm looking at him, Zach. Uh, Zach is a really good buddy of mine. 
I met him at Boulder when we were both there. And I was trying to build a relationship, friendship with him. I was fishing and uh, for people. Uh, I was fishing and just getting to know Zach. And I started trying to ask him things about Jesus. And he kind of showed some interest, but he would never bite He'd kind of like come close, and then he'd kind of be like, I wouldn't hear from him for six months. And then we'd talk a little bit more, and he'd be like, eh, I'm good. And you know what? For four years, nothing really happened that much. We would talk. We'd had a good relationship. And then we didn't really talk for about a year. And six or about three months ago, Zach texts me and just says, hey, man, can we get together? Sure. Met up with Zach, and Zach had just, God had been doing something in his life. Here's the thing is you don't know when God's going to start working on someone. You don't know when it's going to happen. That's why you got to be persistent and patient. And he was just broken before Jesus and put his trust in Jesus. And a, a couple months ago, I got to baptize Zach back there. Patience and persistence. There are people in your life I know that you've been praying for for the last three, four, five years. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's coworkers. Maybe it's friends. Don't give up. Be patient, be persistent, continually sharing who Jesus is, loving people. You cannot give up. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky and Michael Scott. But you have to keep on going. Okay, so another lesson about fishing is eventually, if you're throwing the bait and it's not working, what do you do? Change baits. Like, this ain't working, so you're like, okay, I got to get something else out here. So you, you go in, you, you think, okay, maybe, maybe like this spoon, they tend to bite that before, so you start throwing a different bait. For most of us, we can almost like, as we approach people, we can throw the same bait over and over and over again. Here's some baits that I've seen people throw is people build a friendship with someone. They're like, oh, I want to influence my friends, my family. I'm just going to build a friendship. Or maybe I'll just start asking people, how can I pray for you? That's a great question to ask people. When someone's going through a hard time, I've never once asked someone, hey, I'm a person that believes in prayer. Would you mind if I prayed about that for you? I've never had someone go, no. <laughs> they're like, when someone's hurting, they're like, anything will work. Maybe throw a, can I pray for you? Or, or another bait I throw is invite them to my simple church. I get together with a group of people that I think you would really enjoy. We talk about one verse in the Bible and talk through leadership and how it applies to our life, I think you'd really like it. You should join us sometime. It takes a little bit of courage and boldness, but I'm throwing a different bait. Or maybe a different bait is just serving and loving your neighbor. You see that their sidewalk is not shoveled, you go shovel their sidewalk. You're trying to throw baits of the gospel. What I found is actually the best bait, me personally, the best bait that I can throw to see someone come to know Jesus is just asking questions. I just like asking questions to people. This is actually what Jesus did. He didn't ever really tell people that much. He would ask people. He'd go, who do you think I am? He would just ask them. The thing I've learned is the worst bait is arguing. I've never seen someone come to Jesus because I've argued with them. I'll ask questions, but I'm not going to argue with them. I'm going to ask them, so tell me about your life. What do you care about? Would you consider yourself a spiritual person? Do you believe in God? And I'm just letting them answer and ask them questions. Okay, that's the best bait. The easiest bait to catch a fish with, power bait. Come on, power bait is so easy. I, if I want my kids to catch fish, I'm going to go just throw. I might not catch the biggest or best fish, but I definitely catch some fish with power bait. Do you know what the power bait of us, of Christians, of followers of Jesus is, it's Easter and Christmas. We live in a, we live in like a Christian world where people are like, think about God twice, Christmas and Easter. So you have one week to use this bait. You have one week. We have Easter this coming Sunday that I think is the, one of the easiest ways is, hey, I'm going to church on Easter. Would you want to join me? And we have these One Life cards on your seats, and this is where we ask you guys just to put a name of who's someone you could start praying to invite to Easter. What's the, the person that you can ask to come with you? All right, got two more lessons left. You good with me? Uh, you want to keep it? Okay, the other one, this. Your line will get tangled up. 
You will, if you fish long enough, your line will get tangled up. You'll get really frustrated. You'll say some words that you wish your kids didn't hear, and then you'll keep working it out. And what do you do when your line gets tangled up? You stop and you just work it out. You figure it out and you go back to fishing. Here's what I've seen happen a lot of times when people want to reach their friends and fish for people. They have something go wrong and then they're just like, eh, I'm done fishing. That, that didn't work. No, you just untangle the line and you go back at it. And the number one reason I've seen people get frustrated or, or their line gets tangled up is they get a question they don't know how to answer. Is anybody fearful of that? Like, okay, I'm going to start talking about Jesus, my faith with people, and I, I don't know if I can answer all their questions. Anybody scared about that? Me too. I don't know it all. You know what, though? Most people don't want you to know it all. Those are the worst kind of people anyway, the know-it-alls. <laughs> when you get a question you don't know what to do with, you know what I do? I go, that's a great question. I actually don't know how I would respond to that. Would you mind if I would just go back and think about that? And maybe you think about it too, and we could have another discussion about it. No one's like, you're such an idiot. <laughs> they, they have grace on me. They know that I'm a real person. So if your line gets tangled up or if you get frustrated or if you're like, this doesn't seem to work, take a break, figure it out, and go back to fishing. I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2. It says this, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. We think to lead people to Jesus, we got to have wise and persuasive words. Nope. It must be a demonstration of the Spirit and His power inside of us. And I think it's just a straight demonstration of God's Spirit inside of us when we have the courage and boldness to actually share our faith and to actually reach out, to actually pray for people, actually to care about people. There's this spirit of boldness that comes. Okay, our last and final fishing lesson is this, is you're going to eventually throw the bait. And guess what? You get a bite, and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I, so if you just hold it right here, and they're biting, they're biting, what do you have to do to actually catch this fish? You got to set the hook, and then you got to reel it in. You got to set the hook, and you got to reel it in. So many times in our lives as we're talking with people, God sets up a divine appointment. Have you, I don't know if you've ever been in one of these where all of a sudden you're like, it's happening, I'm talking about God with someone. Oh my goodness. And you're like, what do I do now? What do I do now? <laughs> you set the hook. And you know what it, that action is? It's bold. It's taking courage. It's being a person full of the spirit and reeling it in and believing that God can do what he said he would do and that he would bring them to faith how I set the hook and what I mean by this is that when you have the opportunity, you need to take it. When someone starts engaging, you need to start engaging with them and you need to start asking them questions. And the final way to set the hook is you need to ask people to respond. See, the gospel is not a knowledge-based following. It is a decision-based. It's obedience. It's going, I will do this. And it's how I do this is I just ask people, is there interested in following Jesus, I ask him one simple question. Do you want to trust in Jesus today? Whew, that's bold. But what I've seen is when I will ask that question when someone is interested, they actually have to respond and think about it. And in Romans 1.16, it says, for the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. The power is not in you. The power is not in your words. The power is the gospel, and the gospel is the Jesus. He was perfect. That he came, and he died, and then he raised again to give you life. And if you are in here, and you've never actually received that yourself, I want to tell you today, today's the day. All you must do is make that decision. You go, God, I can't do it on my own, and I want to trust you. I want to make you Lord over my life. The power is in the gospel. I'll close with this. See, my grandpa, he was a great man, man's man. 
fought in the war. He literally was a fisherman. He, was, uh, he worked with his hands. He was a construction worker. He did everything. This is a picture of my grandfather right before he died. And my grandfather grew up in church and around church and believed in things of God, but he was never really moved by Jesus until he faced pancreatic cancer. And when he faced pancreatic cancer for six months, he all of a sudden, God opened his eyes in this tragic event of his life to go, you know what, I need to give my life and soul and faith in Jesus. And that picture actually is in my dad's kitchen. And every time I go back to Oklahoma, I walk in and I see that picture. And I'm so thankful that my grandfather, I get to see him again in heaven. I was 10 years old when he passed away, but I get to see him again in heaven because that's what the hope of the gospel is. And there's a secondary thing that goes through my head every time I see that picture. Jason, go catch fish. Go catch fish. There are too many people that need Jesus. The harvest is plentiful. There's so many people that need this message. But you know what the problem is? There aren't enough people out there fishing. Jesus said to us, Peace be with you as the Father sent me as I was sent to that cross for your sin so that you might have eternal life. Don't hold it to yourself. I'm sending you. Church, we are sent people. Don't be fearful. God's spirit is with us. And if we would go out into the world and we would fish for people, I promise you, we will see an amazing catch in this world will be changed. Will you pray with me? God, we are so grateful for your kingdom and for your son, Jesus, that he came, that we might have life and life everlasting. God, as we just pray and we think about our own lives, how we, we've been given this grace and that as Jesus was sent, now we're sent. God, I pray that you'd give us the strength Amen. Hey, I want you guys for one minute, I'm going to put back up these seven tips. And I just want you to take a minute and pray before God and go, what's one of these that I need to do this week? What's the thing I need to just engage? How can I go engage other people with the good news of Jesus? I just want you to take a few seconds and pray through these and think through which one am I going to do? God, we give you our lives. God, we, even that name we wrote down on our One Life card, God, we pray that you would give us the boldness. God, I pray you would orchestrate it where we're in that situation where we're going, oh my goodness, it's happening. They're biting. I need to invite them to Easter, that we would take that step and do it, God. Thank you that we get to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, it's so great to be back with you guys. Love you guys so, so much. Uh, your generosity is just so unbelievable. When we talk about baptism, you know, we kind of have like typically our baptism Sunday and we'll have a, like five, 10 people get baptized. That's kind of how our old rhythm was. What we found is God is just on the move. Literally, we're like, oh, January is gonna be our baptism month. And then every week, it's like someone wants to get baptized. We had three people this last week want to get baptized. God is at work, guys. This is unbelievable. We're excited for what God is doing. And thank you for your generosity because it makes it happen. And so if you want to give and be a regular giver, you can go online. You can do that on our app. Or you can also grab that little envelope in your chair. And we have boxes in the back that you can give at. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.